Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We don't tend to talk about angels very often in the church service, I think. I mean, yeah, they get their mention around Christmas time. We remember their role as messengers. That's literally what angel means. You know, we remember Gabriel announces the upcoming birth of John the Baptist and Jesus to Zachariah and Mary, respectively. And then Christmas Eve, we, of course, sing angels we have heard on high as we remember the choir that appeared before the shepherds to tell them of Jesus being born. But really, the emphasis is entirely on Jesus lying in the manger, which it should be. Sometimes around Easter, we'll talk a little bit about the angels who are waiting at the tomb to tell the women that Jesus is not there, but he has indeed arisen. But again, the focus is on the empty tomb. The angels are just kind of there in passing. So just think, when is the last time you heard a sermon focused on angels themselves? You ever heard one? I don't know that I've given one, so this will be new. The pious answer for this, of course, is that we don't want to run the risk of people walking away thinking angels should be worshipped, which is a greater temptation than you might think. Paul specifically has to warn the Colossians against worshipping angels in 2.18, and even St. John, at the end of his revelation, almost falls down to worship his angel guide in 22 verse 8 and has to be reminded not to do that, that only God is worthy of worship. Even today, and I don't know if this is just me because the algorithm is really bizarre when it comes to my case, but I get weird emails constantly with articles on how to properly pray to the angels to get what I want because uh, the new age trend portrays angels as some kind of like lesser God that can be a pathway to get whatever you want as something to be worshipped in some way, shape, or form. It's just something about having, you know, they're a spiritual being, they dwell in the heavens, and yet they are created rather than eternal like God. And I think that makes them just a little bit more approachable, for lack of a better term, as an object of worship. It's a more palatable being to offer our prayers to and requests than the infinite and mysterious and eternal God with a capital G. And so I've heard multiple theologians hypothesize the reason the Bible really doesn't give us very many details about angels and demons themselves, fallen angels, is a ward against this natural human curiosity about them, lest we dig too deeply into the lore and thus miss the forest for the trees on the true focus of the scriptures, which is God's enduring and steadfast love for creation shown through that redemptive work of Jesus Christ. The less pious answer for why we don't talk about angels very much, I think, is ironically, when we're not accidentally worshiping them, we don't really take them very seriously. You know, the same way that pop culture has kind of relegated to the devil to a cartoonish man in a red suit to the point where we have to be reminded he's a legitimate threat. So to have angels kind of just become the cute, innocent, precious moments figurines in our artwork. They show up as characters in TV programs like Supernatural or Lucifer when the showrunners need to invoke heaven into the plot, but again, they need a more palatable in-between presence rather than actually depicting God. And so while we may intellectually understand angels are real beings within God's created order, on an emotional level, this kind of cultural saturation makes us a little embarrassed to admit that we truly believe they're out there, as though Believing in angels is on some level the same as believing in vampires and werewolves. So it's good that today we get to observe the feast of St. Michael and all angels to remind ourselves of this deeper level of reality that so often gets pushed aside in favor of the material realm, which we personally can see and taste and touch. And so central to today is our reading from the book of Revelation itself, a look at those deeper levels of reality. That is how the book got its title, that that which is being revealed as the curtain is lifted, is the spiritual realm, what's happening behind the scenes of the material world in which we live. And so while it's most popularly known for its predictions about the final day of judgment, the central theme of it really is just the encouragement for Christians of knowing what is going on in the heaven amongst everything we're going through right now. 
So during, you know, all, all the horrors we see in the end times, as predicted in the book, the plagues, the persecutions, the unleashing of the horsemen, wars and rumors of wars, and so on. Just when it always seems the darkest, the vision always returns to the heavens, seeing Jesus seated on his throne, ruling triumphant, giving us the assurance that throughout all hardships, even the non-apocalyptic ones, our Lord's victory remains assured. For we are not materialists. We know there is that unseen realm. And Paul warns us that is where the real battles are taking place. Our true existential threats are not climate change or the wrong person getting into the White House or the looming danger of World War III, but sin, death, and the devil. Paul tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So he writes in Ephesians. That's an interesting turn of phrase at the end. How can there be spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places? That's not where we think we would find it. But if you can recall the start of the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, that is the divine council of angels, they came to present themselves before the Lord, and the Satan also came among them. And from there, you know, Satan begins his accusations against Job, and the, the set stage is set for the rest of the book. But it would seem that Satan had a seat waiting for him with the council. And you'll notice I said the Satan, not Satan, because Satan itself is actually a title. It's not a name. It translates to the accuser. So as strange as it may seem, even after his failed rebellion in heaven, even after he causes the fall of man by tempting Adam and Eve, Within the courtroom drama of, his, of the history of salvation, Satan retains this role as the prosecutor. He is there to accuse humanity of our own sins, throwing our crimes in our faces, reminding the holy and perfect Lord of just how far we have fallen short, how we likewise deserve the damnation that was destined for him since his rebellion. And the worst part of that is that even though the other title he has of devil from the Greek word diabolos means slanderer, he doesn't have to slander us to do it. He doesn't have to create falsehoods to accuse us. We know our own sins are egregious enough. If justice is to be carried out, we need to be fully accused of what we have done wrong. The prosecutor has to do his job. We know that God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, but do you think the devil would really let him Forget your transgressions? The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places would have your salvation undone, your guilt exposed, without any hope of even a plea bargain. Yet herein lies the joy of reading Revelation chapter 12. The angel Michael leads the forces, and he leads the charge against the foe and his army, and Michael is victorious. Not only that, but there, Satan loses his seat as the prosecutor. By the authority of Christ and his atonement won for us by his death and resurrection, Satan and his minions who accuse us day and night before our God are thrown down to the earth, falling like lightning, as Jesus said in today's gospel reading. Michael becomes the means by which Christ's victory is realized in the heavenly realms so that the devil no longer has God's ear. No more can he remind God of our sins after we have been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, there is great rejoicing in heaven as all evil is removed from that holy place in preparation for the final day of judgment when Satan is locked away forever, as shown in chapter 20. And it's interesting to me that Michael is the one chosen for this great and holy task. You know, we would assume Jesus should be the one to cast Satan out of heaven, after all. We do have a Christocentric hermeneutic. We're always looking to Christ as the source of our salvation. We always speak about how his death on the cross is what freed us from sin, Satan, and death. And it just feels like he should be the one showing Satan the door. Even here, we are told Michael conquers him by the blood of the Lamb. So why does the great honor of kicking Satan out fall to the archangel rather than the Son of God? Now, this is conjecture on my part, I think, but I think it's to remind us of the 
hierarchy at play here. Because as we struggle against our own sins and temptations in daily life, as we behold Satan's campaign against the church in the world, and as we are emotionally shaped by the less than great theology existing in pop culture, it's easy to fall into the trap of dualism, of thinking that Satan is this dark god on equal footing with the Lord, just you know, evil, and there's still a chance he might win in the end because the scales are evenly balanced. But Revelation 12 reminds us that Satan is a created being. He and his angels are fallen angels. They're no match for the Most High. They're down here. So Jesus, way up here, he most certainly could kick him out of heaven without any struggle. But that would be overkill. Michael, the angel, the servant of the Lord, empowered by the blood of Christ, is more than enough to overcome the devil and cast him out. There simply is no competition at all. Our Lord's ultimate victory is assured. Satan is undone. Which brings us to the final portion of today's reading. Against the joy in heaven remains the woe here on earth. For though Satan has been cast out and no longer accuses us in the Father's presence, though the Father now sees the Son's justification when he beholds us as we have been washed clean in his sacraments, it still says, Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. The final judgment is yet to come, and until that time, Satan's little season is here. His loss is set in stone, but he is going to scorch as much earth as he can in his retreat until that day when he is finally locked away forever. And so Paul's warning remains that we struggle not against flesh and blood, but those spiritual powers of darkness. Peter Peter warns us to remain alert, as the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for souls to devour. We know his influence remains felt in the here and now. We see it in the way we continually fall into sin and are unable to conquer our temptations. We see it in the insanity of the world as it falls further away from God. We see it in the wars and rumors of wars and natural disasters and diseases and all of the other pains that make us groan in this life. Yet amidst Satan's little season here, the purpose of St. John's revelation remains. Just when it seems the darkest in this world, when it looks like Satan might really win in the end as we fall into despair and we fail to see how the mess that is 2024 can get any worse, we remember Christ is still sitting on his throne with that ultimate victory promised. And until that day comes, we remember we have not been thrown unto the wolves. Christ isn't just sitting there distant watching this all play out. But against the demonic influences of this world, our Lord has his own mightier army in the heavenly host, the Sabaoth, those angels whom he sends forth to defend us against those spiritual assaults of the fallen angels, who join us even now in the divine service, which is the place where heaven and earth meet, to assist us even in praising our Lord and Savior. So today we remember to give thanks to God that he has provided these spiritual guardians for us, that he has empowered his armies to most definitely conquer the great foe. And we join with the angels and the archangels as we give thanks to our Lord for all he has done for us, as we join together in that heavenly hymn of praise, as we prepare to receive the foretaste of the feast to come, as that very empowering blood of the Lamb comes to forgive our sins and strengthen our faith, in the sacrament of the altar. So may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the life everlasting.